In today's video, we're gonna be covering the top 10 most common construction mistakes. Hello, Mr. George. How much you pay for the for the new guys? All right, this video is not gonna be about safety or specific project mistakes as we just saw, but rather about general issues that can impact almost any project that we can focus on moving forward. So let's go. So starting at number 10, we have pre-construction efforts. Now, what I mean by pre-construction efforts is literally everything that happens before anyone steps foot on an actual job site to start building. So this pre-construction phase includes the design process, which is the creation of your construction documents, such as your drawings and specifications. It also includes pre-bid estimates, pre-bid schedules, and establishing general contract language. Now, a construction project is essentially born and molded during this phase, meaning these early conversations are extremely critical because they are the bridge that connects all the efforts that follow this phase, which is the actual construction phase. So not every individual or role is part of this early process, depending on different company roles and responsibility structures, but a lot of the most common construction mistakes that impact construction projects start as small issues only to gain momentum and snowball throughout the course of a project. The best way to avoid mistakes during this pre-construction phase is actually just back checking the work with multiple sets of eyes and additional input, understanding your commitments as well as the commitments you're asking others to take on, and just maximizing your pre-planning efforts in general. Moving on to number nine, which is everything technology related. A fairly simple but common mistake in the industry is the use of bad technology or not understanding how to use good technology, using the wrong technology for the application, or just not using technology at all. Now, construction is a fast-paced industry, and construction projects typically never end the way they were initially intended to end or that the way they were initially designed. Either things change due to unforeseen circumstances, missing or lacking details from the start, or the owner just wants to change something during the course of construction. Well, this is why technology is so critical. Now, there is nothing wrong with updating hard copy sets of drawings on a small scale or in the office trailer, but large construction projects can have upwards of hundreds to thousands of people on site at any given time, which makes the delivery of information critical as our field workers move fast and they are efficient. So how do you transmit information to potentially thousands of people simultaneously? Well, through technology. Most companies nowadays just work off iPads with the drawings linked and are referenceable through the cloud via software companies like Procore or Autodesk. So when the drawings are updated and uploaded to the cloud, those working on the cloud get an immediate updated copy while those working with hard copy sets are immediately looking at an old and outdated incorrect set of drawings. Again, a lot can happen in construction in a single day, meaning those field installers working off of hard sets of drawings could be wasting a lot of time and money installing something that is not correct based on current approved drawings. So bad technology can plague almost every aspect of construction from poor communication, for scheduling, budgeting, and more. The example I gave is just one potential impact of misuse of technology or not using technology. Number eight, inadequate manpower. Now, inadequate manpower can stem from a few things, and I'm not gonna talk about the general labor shortages, which are a major issue, but those are less controllable as far as this discussion goes. What I do wanna talk about is actual resource planning. Meaning, does the job or task at hand have the correct labor assigned to it? Now, more manpower does not necessarily mean faster completion times, as there are limits to how productive a single task can be. So, coordinating manpower via a labor plan is necessary. During the pre-construction estimating and budgeting phases, total hours are calculated in an estimate to match scope. So assigning the correct labor crew sizes and durations to match this estimate during the course of construction through scheduling is absolutely necessary as well. Now, a project can definitely get in trouble when the original estimate is incorrect from the get-go, 
which relates back to pre-construction and there's really no good solution to resolve this aside from just some critical thinking or just absorbing those extra hours. As a project team, it's incredibly important to keep a pulse on manpower. The best tools to track this would be your initial labor plan, your schedule, tracking production reports and productivity, and getting updates via a daily form and huddle. So moving on to number seven, we have material procurement or failing to procure material to meet the project schedule. Since buildings are built from essentially three things being labor, material, and equipment, planning for material procurement is extremely important so that when the labor shows up to actually install that material, it's on site and ready to go. The material procurement approval process is completed via issuing contracts, issuing purchase orders, approving submittals, reviewing samples, completing coordination, and reviewing overall schedules for timing of release. So again, without material, there is nothing to build. But getting these approvals of the material and coordinating the correct time to get it on site is a lot more difficult than you'd think, just based on everything required from field measurements to coordination amongst multiple trades. It can definitely be a complex process depending on the construction project, the quality of the design documents, the responsiveness of individuals, and the amount of contractors just involved in the project. The best way to avoid issues with getting material to the job site is just by managing the material through a material procurement log, some sort of technology to do this. Uh, it could be an Excel document alongside a submittal log using that software we talked about earlier, such as Procore. Now, in an upcoming video, I'll actually go through generating a procurement log, what to put on a procurement log, how to track a procurement log, uh, how often to update a procurement log, as well as giving you an example of a procurement log. So stay tuned for that. Okay, moving on to number six, which is coordination, or really the lack of coordination. Now, a $50 million project might have 30 or 40 different contractors on that project, and each of those contractors have their own scope of work to complete that they are specifically focused on. This means that 20 to 30 contractors may have two to five people installing material that touches or interacts in some way with another contractor's materials. Now, this is where coordination and sequence come into play, as the construction documents do not always detail out every aspect of construction. Behind walls, above ceilings, and in floors are all potential pathways of different mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection systems, and more. These are drawn by the design team, but are rarely coordinated by the design team, meaning that there is the potential for two different contractors of two different trades who want to take that same space and use it so it's convenient for them to get their duct or piping through. In the construction industry, this is what we refer to as a clash. So in lieu of wasting time in the field as these individuals are standing there, potentially arguing about who gets to install their piece of pipe, duct, or conduit, it's important to tackle these items on the front end before this happens. So when coordinating, you need to figure out who is gonna be the lead on different coordination efforts and clearly establish who that person is. You'll wanna set up coordination meetings and ensure that everyone is coming prepared to discuss coordination items at hand and focus on schedule as part of this effort, meaning which coordination items need to be addressed before others. And coordination is not just limited to MEP or mechanical electrical plumbing or fire protection trades. It can be any trade on the job site. It can be handled on a small scale from simple team huddles with the contract documents in front of you to more in-depth coordination using models on more complex projects. Continuing on to number five, managing or mismanaging budget. Okay, now budgets are for the most part established at the start of the project so that owners have an expectation of what the project is going to cost according to contractual obligations. Now, it's the role of the project manager to manage that budget while keeping track of costs that hit the job. Literally every penny that is spent on a large commercial construction project is typically reviewed and approved by the project manager and subsequently the owner or potentially the owner's rep. This is extremely critical because if the budget is mishandled, then just about every other problem imaginable can surface as a result. 
Now, budgeting is made out to be a lot more complex in construction than it really is, but it's similar to how someone would budget a vacation. You itemize all the things you anticipate will have a cost, you assign a budget to cover that cost, and then you make sure that you stay within those budgets throughout the course of your vacation, or in this sense, construction. The most difficult aspects of managing a construction budget is just how many itemized lines you're tracking on a larger project, potential unforeseen items, scope gaps which are unaccounted items, amongst a multitude of other issues. Again, just imagine your vacation and the unexpected costs that might pop up along the way such as a flat tire. So the first item I mentioned is managed during the course of construction, but the majority of issues that I just spoke about often arise during the pre-construction phase meaning the pre-construction, again, has the potential to snowball and majorly impact projects via budgets down the road. Number four, I've got managing your schedule. The biggest misconception when it comes to construction is thinking that you create your schedule one time and then you're done scheduling. Well, unless you're running a small project that's less than a month in duration, this is so far from the truth. Schedules are living documents that require constant attention and updates from weekly to monthly. Along with the project documents and specifications, the schedule is the roadmap that keeps everyone in the loop on the status of the project. Proper scheduling helps assist in good planning, as people can be proactive versus reactive to the construction project. Schedules through regular updates are the main indicator of whether or not a project is heading in the right direction. Now, detailed project scheduling is probably the most underestimated tool utilized in construction, but likely because it's also the most difficult aspect of construction to master. So for this channel, I've actually purchased a copy of some scheduling software to start showing you the basic principles behind creating updating and managing a schedule throughout the course of a construction project. Number three, not understanding the drawings and specifications. Now, we've got to give ourselves some grace because nobody is born with the inherent ability to read construction drawings or specifications, and it's not necessarily a fun task. I've come to realize that many people in the industry mainly do not understand how to read drawings because there are so few learning resources on this subject. It was a complete struggle for me when I started, which is why my channel focuses so heavily on learning how to read drawings. Learning to read drawings is the first step to understanding constructability, sequencing, scheduling, and planning. And even after years of practice, it's still a difficult task to process and it's just so much information coming at you that you have to continuously practice this effort. So my advice for this is just practice. 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 Yes, it'll be boring, but it will improve your overall capabilities within the construction industry. All right, this takes us down to number two, which is poor communication and poor relationship building. So the industry is built on good communication and solid relationships as it takes hundreds, if not thousands of people to build these large commercial construction projects. That means that almost every correspondence, communication effort, and relationship has an impact on the overall success of a project. The better the communication, especially in the event of design updates and changes, the better the outcome of the project, plain and simple. So this has forced me over the years to learn how to become a better communicator. What this also means is being adaptive because people receive, absorb, and process information differently. Some people are verbal learners while others are more visual. Some like detail while others like general or broad information. Me personally, I'm a huge visual learner, so when I convey information, I usually put together a document that has some sort of visual behind it so that I can kind of explain to the individual what we're looking at and what I'm expressing verbally. And you'll notice that in my videos, I always try to make an attempt to put some sort of visual behind what I'm talking about. So while talking to hundreds of people throughout the course of a project, you've got to learn quickly how to effectively implement different styles of communication and this comes from building a good relationship and understanding who that individual is. This just comes with practice and time, 
So good communication builds good relationships, which build better projects. All right, so we have made it to the number one mistake or general issue that I see in construction, which is inadequate planning. <laughs> Now, every other topic I've previously discussed in this video is and can directly be associated with poor planning, as far as an issue goes. At the end of the day, you're looking to accomplish a goal, which is building a building for a certain budget within a specific timeline using established resources. Now, just like any other aspect of life, completing a successful project is all about execution but you need a proper plan in order to properly execute. If you plan out all the details with a roadmap to success, you're more likely to achieve that success. If you go into something without a plan, you won't necessarily fail, but the odds of having mistakes pop up and the stress increase is definitely increased itself. So the main two factors to proper or improper planning are time and experience. If you're new to the industry, you should be spending a lot more time planning because you're likely lacking that experience. And I get it, it's the age old need job for experience, need experience for job type situation. So once you get more experience, you can take that with you to the next project and implement what went good during the planning phases as well as what didn't. Okay, I hope you gathered some good information in today's video about the most common construction mistakes the last piece of advice I'll give you is just to be patient as everyone makes mistakes. And this is a complex industry with a lot of moving parts. So as always, be better, build better, and bye for now.